What's the word, y'all? Welcome back. Please ignore my hair. Some of y'all noticed that first day of getting a retwist, your hair is crispy, but a little bit too crispy. That's the state I am right now. Now, we're about to do something rare. I try my best to um, diversify and just, just talk about different things from day to day. But the last time we talked, we talked about Clay Day, then we talked about the Grizzlies. So I got to circle back and talk about the Grizzlies because, well, they're on a 10-game win streak, and they just beat the Warriors. And this team is so electric and so so very fun. I went to look at all the wins they got on the season and listen to the quality wins they got. They beat the Warriors twice. I'm pretty sure they're the only team in the league that can say that. I saw a stat that said coming into this game, John Morant was 4-4 four and four against the Warriors in his short NBA career. Now he's 5-4 and four against the Warriors. So he's got two wins against the Warriors this season. They beat the Nets, the Suns, the Heat, and the Jazz. Those are six of the most elite teams in the entire NBA, and the Grizzlies have wins on them. And now they got a lot of people uh, tweeting, asking, are the Grizzlies the real deal? Will you put the Grizzlies in title contender? I don't really know. But a couple days ago, somebody asked me on Twitter, um, or I guess on these videos, Kenny, who is your favorite young court to watch in the NBA? And the first name that came to mind was, was the Cavs. And I stuck by that, you know what I'm saying? Because in my mind, the Grizzlies didn't even come to, they didn't come to mind. Because they seem so much older than what they are. John Morant's rookie season, they were half game away from making the playoffs, and it basically came down to the final day of the NBA. They needed a win. They got a win. The Trailblazers needed to lose, but the Trailblazers won, so boom, they were on the outside looking in. Then the sophomore season, they ended up um, in the play-in. They ended up winning the play-in tournament. They go against the Jazz in the first round and take game one. So in my mind, they were older than what they are. So I looked at today's game, and you know what? I'm already seeing people on Twitter say, ah, it's, a, it's an okay win, but Draymond Green wasn't there, yada, yada. Listen, bro. We are in 2022 in a pandemic. Everybody, all 30 teams are missing players. If we were adding asterisks by every win this season, there's nothing to talk about in the NBA. So sure, Draymond Green was out, but Steven Adams was out. It doesn't matter. Let's just talk about the wins at face value, okay? So I went to go look at their rotation today, and there was only one player that was playing today that is older than I am. I am 25 years old. Cal Anderson was the only guy that got PT today for the Grizzlies that is older than I am. So if I did my math right, which I probably didn't because I have dyslexia and numbers are hard, uh, the average age of their rotation tonight was 23 and a half. And I was like, you know what? How does that compare to the, uh, the entire NBA? Their roster right now is tied for the second youngest roster in the entire NBA. And like I said, they're on a 10-game win streak, beating the Warriors two times. The Warriors early in the season, remember, people are talking about, could they beat their own record of 73-9? and nine? They have 10 losses on the year. Two of those are to John Moran and the Memphis Grizzlies, the second youngest team in the entire NBA. They are tied, at least when it comes to the game back standings with the Utah Jazz, who um, are in a three-game losing streak because Rudy Gobert is a healthy state protocol and they can't stop anybody. They're giving up 120-plus points per game with Rudy Gobert being out now and one of those losses against the, the uh, Detroit Pistons. And when Rudy Gobert plays, they only give up like 103. Yeah. Yeah, that's propaganda for Rudy Gobert. <laughs> you know he does that on this channel. It's here. Uh, but I just want to talk about the Grizzlies because they have done their rebuilds. It was so, I mean, they're still in the rebuild phase. I said that they're the second youngest team in the NBA. But they were doing their rebuilds so fast and so nice. It should be the model for these smaller market teams. Now, one thing you cannot control is whether or not you're lucky. And the Memphis Grizzlies became very, very lucky the year that they got John Morant in the 2019 NBA draft. Y'all know when I do these ramble videos, I very rarely have notes. Um, but I have notes today, y'all. I, I literally have notes. So you know I'm invested in this. So the tw in 2019, the NBA decided to flatten the lottery odds, meaning that they were trying to combat tanking. Um, before then, if you were the worst team in the NBA record-wise, you had a 25%-ish percent chance to get the first overall pick. The NBA was like, wow, we got too many teams trying to bottom out. The Charlotte Hornets tried to bottom out and got 25% chance to get Anthony Davis, but ended up Michael Carter-Williams. Um, the 76ers during the process was bottoming out every single season. So the NBA was like, ah, we can't have that. Nobody's watching those teams. So let's let's flatten the odds. So now I think it's like the top three or the bottom three teams have close to equal odds to get in the first overall pick. So in the 2019 NBA draft, the Memphis Grizzlies had a, only a 6.3% chance to jump up into the oh to get the second overall pick. And they got that. Now, again, there's a ton of luck in getting John Moran on your team. Actually, Zion and John Morant both were like super lucky picks. You know, the Pelicans weren't the worst team in the league the year that they got, and uh, uh, well, Anthony Davis was there, but they, they got Zion. So that was like, hmm, could that have been rigged? The NBA trying to convince people not to tank anymore by giving the first and second pick to teams that weren't tanking? Mm, 
I don't know. Conspiracy Kenny is here. But no, 6.3% uh, chance of getting the second overall pick. They did that. And now it's about, hmm, what do we do now? We drafted this dude out of a mid-major who looked really good in the tourney. He was dominating. What do we do now to build the perfect team around here? And they did some pretty good things. I mean, even before John Morant got there, they they gave um, they told the world, like, hey, if you come to Memphis and you have a good career for us, we're going to set you up, man. They traded Marcus all the way to the Toronto Raptors, and boom, he won a championship. Was it the best deal for them? Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But they sent him to a team where he can get the best out of himself, and that was getting a championship. And then after they ended up with John Morant, they sent their one of their other best guys in franchise history, Mike Conley, to another team to compete for a championship, and he's still doing that, but he's on a better team. Is he on a better team? I mean, right now, they're tied in the game's back column. Is he on a better team? I don't really know. But they've done that, and then they've done things around the edges. The Jaron Jackson Jr. pick has been great, and I'm in love with the way Jaron Jackson Jr. has played during this streak, especially when Steven Adams is out. Him as the five has looked amazing. Um, especially during this, him at the five has looked so good. And I think I talked about this in the last one that they were, they've been afraid to let Jaron Jackson Jr. run the five exclusively because of, of the way they bang at the five position. Can we trust him not to foul out of games? He's been so very good at the five this season. It's been so impressive because that was the development I've been waiting on. I mean, I guess he was drafted in just 2018, but I've been waiting on that because him as a stretch five would open up the game so much more for the team and for John Morant if they had shooters all around. And right now they got that. Um, the, some of the other very underrated trades they've done since getting John Morant, they got DeAnthony Melton for Javon Carter. That is a W. And the biggest one is trading for Desmond Bain, 30th overall pick. Huge. I mean, yes, you can't really control whether or not you're a lucky team, but the smaller markets need to really be looking at what the Memphis Grizzlies have done and looking at that as a little blueprint. Little blueprint. You got to make the right trades and the right signings. Like the Cal Anderson signing, they offered him a contract that's a little bit too rich for the Spurs' blood, but was good of, enough of a team-friendly contract for them. Tyus Jones, who was one of the biggest X-Factors today, very good contract to get for him. They've made the right moves on the edges, and when you already have the inside, which is John Moran and Jaron Jackson Jr., everything else is falling into place. So are they a contender right now? I don't have the answer to that question. We won't know. But it, at the end of the day, they're the most electric team to watch in the NBA right now. John Moran is must-see TV, and the Memphis Grizzlies are fun. Even when they were really good, we're talking grit and grind era. I don't know of many kids back. Grit and grind was like, when I was high school, right? Was that high school for me? Anyway, I don't know kids that was walking around in Grizzlies jerseys, bro. And I went to a suburban uh, high school. Dogs, kids was wearing NBA jerseys daily. Bros, they, they, y'all, some of y'all are collecting NBA jerseys. Nobody was rocking a Mike Conley, Marcus Saul, Zebo, Tony Allen. Well, Tony Allen may have got some love in Chicago. Um, but I know people are walking around in John Moran jerseys. I went to a Bulls Pacers game December 26th. And a John Morant jersey was in the crowd. What the hell are you wearing? That's how electric the bros impacted <laughs> the whole Midwest. Is Memphis Midwest? I'm gonna. Uh, he is. He's impacting the whole Midwest. They got people in Chicago rocking the jersey. So it's just super fun. Um, will this streak last forever? Is the next question. Possibly. Possibly. All right. Let's talk about some of the other games of the day because though this was a big day for the Memphis Gri Memphis Grizzlies, there were a lot of good games today, man. Starting off with the first game of the day, the Thunder against the Wizards. This is a game where there was no Bradley Beal because I guess he's back in health and safety protocol, which is very weird. I don't, I'm not a virus person, the medicine person, scientist, but he had entered health and safety protocol. He had got out, got his shot, and then went back in all within like two weeks. I don't, that's got to be like some of the rarest thing. Maybe it's not, I don't really know, but he's not there. So it's like, okay, this opens the game up for somebody else. And it's been Kuz. Kuz has been on a extreme hot streak right now. And I made a tweet about Kuzma today and people thought, misinterpreted it, but it's Twitter. I guess you can't really get the full grasp. If you had to explain every tweet that I will not be on Twitter. If you had to use your 150 characters to really flesh. Listen, I said something along the lines of like, Every time Kuzma shoots the ball, I expect it to miss, but it goes in. I can understand how you can interpret that a damn Kenny, a hater. But no, it's the exact opposite. I'm admiring his tough shot making. There was a play specifically in his fourth quarter where he did like a spin move at like the, the elbow. And instead of like doing a full form jump shot, he just like floated it on a spin move. And it like cast in. I'm like, bro, that was a super tough shot. And that was the reason why I made my tweet. So it was like me admiring his tough shot making. Um, but I will say he kind of sold me today because I took the overall prize picks on his rebounds because he's been a rebounding machine in all season. 
But he was like, nah, I just want to exclusively score. Um, and he he did that. Hey, they got they got a big time win. And I guess there was a fight in the locker room between KCP and Montrez Harrell. Hmm? Um, I wonder how that stuff works. Like who? Okay, so the story goes: um, Montrez and Catavius Caldwell Pope got into it, and then they before anybody could get into the locker room, it was basically over. They they both threw like punches, and they both missed. If it was just them two, I don't know how you both throw punches and miss. You don't really want to hit the guy. Um, and my my question when stuff like this comes out is. Who is the snitch that called Shams in Chicago or all the sources like, hey, you want to know something crazy? I know we won today, but KCP and Trez, bro, them bros, was, they was throwing punches in them. Who is, who is the guy that's letting all this information get out? Because it, happen, it happens all across the league. Or maybe it doesn't. Maybe this happens way more often than we think, but it only seeps out every once in a while. I mean, it's been happening. I mean, that's like two big locker room altercations so far this season, but maybe there's been more we don't even know about. Either way. A win for the Washington Wizards. Um, I know it was against a OKC team that's struggling, uh, but still, you got to count your wins where you can get them. Shea Gears Alexander gets out of that slump he had been in, and that's always a good thing. I didn't like on the last possession, they were down by four with like seven, eight seconds, and instead of trying to get something quick or shoot a three, they wasted a timeout and then shot a three at the buzzer. So even if it went in, there was no. Next game we could talk about is the Suns versus the Raps. I forgot that the Suns are still um, below. 10 losses, the only team that hasn't hit double-digit losses. That's kind of wild when you really think about it. Uh, they went to Scotiabank Arena, and they got a win against the Raptors. But, hey, Scotty Barnes, look, we can add an asterisk by every single game. I promise you we could add an asterisk by every single game. Um, but the Suns did what they had to do. Chris Paul, late in the game, what, what do you think? If he hit a big-time shot, where do you think that shot came from? Yep, the mid-range elbow, he does that. Um, the most fun thing about this, or funny thing about this, is Devin Booker getting mad at the, the mascot. When he's used to shooting free throws in front of 20,000 fans, he's just goes to Bank Arena in Canada where there's no fans, but he got upset with the one bystander who happened to be doing stuff. It's a funny thing. Uh, Pascal Siakam had a good game, but I mentioned in the last episode, Pascal Siakam is in his best or in his bag the most when he can hit his threes, and today he did not hit his threes, and he ended up losing this game. Um, next game, the Bulls win a large one, a big margin of victory against the Pistons. Don't have much to say. I'm glad that they just took care of business because we have bigger games later this um, this week. The Warriors and the Nets. And though this was a great defensive game today against a bad team, I'm a little bit worried about those games, Bulls fans. I'm keeping a buck with you. Our defense has not looked great. I think they showed it on the broadcast in this nine-game streak that we just was on that was broken up by the, the um, Dallas Mavericks the other day. The Bulls had the 22nd defense in the league. That's not good. <laughs> they had the number one offense with the 22nd defense. It's not good, fellas. Let's, hopefully we clamp up against the Warriors and the, the Brooklyn Nets because we, we want to see those wins. Um, and then the next game, Tiny Dog came through. He had this is this is the Pelicans almost blowing a game and then needing Brandon Ingram to get them out of that because I had turned this game off because they were up at like six or seven like a minute ago and I know it's the NBA anything can happen but I wasn't really invested in, it in the first place and then um the, it got started getting a little bit closer and closer at one point it was like a one point I'm like bro I should tune back in I guess Anthony Edwards went overdrive um and Tiny Dog I had turned it off he had hit a uh, and one three, and I was like, you know what? That's enough. That's the dagger. That's all he needed. And one three, he came back, hit another three, and then hit the game winner. So shout out to Brandon Ingram with a thirty three nine to four. Brandon Ingram is for the most part a very emotionless person. So when he hits a game winner and he he shows emotion, I'm super excited for him. Um, I know the Pelicans, you know, a good win for them because they're telling the world that they're still going for a playing spot because they believe Zion can come back, and like. Zion is about as far away from <laughs> New Orleans as you could be right now. They said bro was training up in what, Portland? That, that's about as far as you could get from New Orleans without leaving the country. Is he going to come back this season? I don't even know. You know what? With the Grizzlies playing so well, they got people on Twitter talking about Zion right now because now people are redrafting that draft. 2019, would you take Ja right now over Zion? I think 90%, 97% of people probably say, yeah, we're taking Ja. Not much injury history in his, um, in his bag right now with Zion. Kind of a lot, kind of a lot. And then the last game of the day, the reason why I'm recording this at 145 is because I stayed up to watch the Clippers versus the Nuggets. Why did I torture myself in this game where I think the, the Clippers, let me go ahead, they had like 30 points in the first half. Um, They had a comeback, though. So I'm glad I did stay up. There was no real takeaways. They had 28 points at halftime, the Clippers did, and they won the game. They had 28 points at halftime, and they won the game. Reggie Jackson had some big-time shots. The Bled Show showed up in the fourth quarter, and I heard one of my favorite calls of this season. Um, It was Amir Coffey hit a shot at the top of the key, and whoever's calling the calls, I'm sorry, I don't know every commentator in the league's name, they said, 
um, s- caffeine supremacy or something. Sup- Supreme caffeine, Supreme caffeine, because his name is Coffee, and people are saying it on my um under my tweet that I guess they have a bunch of coffee puns when Amir Coffee does something great. So I got to start listening to the Clippers broadcast or watching Clippers more because I mentioned last episode they be having either the super late night game or the first game of the day at noon. And then you know what? To open my eyes a little bit because somebody was in the comment section say Kenny, um that game is not for you. It's for the European fans. You're absolutely right. But why are we subjecting the European fans to exclusively Clippers games? <laughs> exclusively the Clippers games. We just t- try to turn them? I don't really know. Um, let me know what you think in the comment section of today's slate of games. Uh, the John Moran and the Memphis Grizzlies. I just got an update, and I hope it's nothing bad. It was from Shams or something, and I think I saw the name John Moran. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to improvise real quick before I look this up because what if they said something bad? I don't really know. I don't, I don't want to publish this video without knowing. Nope, the last tweet from Shams had to do with the fight between KCP. So if that wasn't him, it had to be Woj. Woj ESPN says, John Moran has felt like the Grizzlies haven't been given their due respect in the past. I re- okay, yeah. And I like that they hate Iggy. I love it. I love that the city don't like Iggy. I just, that, that's a plus for me. Honestly, not, not saying that I don't like Iggy. Actually, I do like Iggy. But the fact that they found a common enemy in Andre Iguodala, out of all people, I respect.